Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our worship service this morning. You who are gathered here with in this house of worship and for also our, our worshipers who are watching at home this morning through the recording. We gather here on this fourth Sunday in our season of Lent to once again contemplate and remember God's great love for us in Jesus our Savior and the glorious light of his gospel message that he has shined upon us for our salvation and eternal good. We'll be following the order of service that is printed in our bulletin for this morning, also in our celebration of the Lord's Supper today. We begin our service this morning joining in our opening hymn, hymn number 576. stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worry and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we confess that we deserve to be punished for our evil deeds, but we ask you graciously to cleanse us from all sin and to comfort us with your salvation. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. 
Please be seated. We join in our psalm today, Psalm 27, in the front portion of our hymn. First scripture lesson for this, the fourth Sunday on the season of Lent, is recorded for us in St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 8 through 14. For you once, swore you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And do not participate in fruitless deeds of darkness. Instead, expose them. For it is shameful even to mention the things that are done by people in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For it is light that makes things visible. Therefore it is said, Awake, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Here ends our first lesson. We join now in the verse of the day. stand for the gospel of our Lord. 
The Gospel according to John, chapter 9. Glory be to you, O Lord. As Jesus was passing by, he saw a blind a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that God's works might be revealed in connection with him. I must do the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, Jesus spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and spread the mud on the man's eyes. Go, Jesus told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed, and came back seeing. They brought this man who had been blind to the Pharisees. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees also asked him how he received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man told him. I washed and now I see. Then some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others were saying, how can a sinful man work such miraculous signs? There was division among them. So they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him because he opened your eyes? The man replied, he is a prophet. They answered him, you were entirely born in sinfulness, yet you presume to teach us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. When he found him, he asked, Do you believe in the Son of God? Who is he, sir? The man replied, That I may believe in him. Jesus answered, You have seen him, and he is the very one who is speaking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe. And he knelt down and worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, in order that those who do not see will see and those who do see will become blind. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated. This Gospel text will also be serving as the sermon text for today. We'll continue with our children's sermon. Children, please come on forward. you to put your hands, I want you to close your eyes and put your hands over your eyes. Now you can't see anything, can you? So that's what it's like when a person is blind. A person is blind because no light can come into their eyes and work on their eyes. Now think for a minute if you had always been blind. Would you know what your mom and dad look like? No. Would you know what each other looks like? No. Would you know what the sky or the trees or anything would look like? No. And wouldn't it be wonderful then if all of a sudden, if you had never, you can take your hands off now, Lucas. Wouldn't it be wonderful that if after all that time, you suddenly you could see and you would know what your parents look like and you know what I look like and the trees and, and everything else. That would be a pretty wonderful thing, wouldn't it? And sometimes that happens, where people who can't see are finally able to see, and they're very happy when they do that. And today we're gonna to hear about a man that Jesus met who had been blind his whole life. And then Jesus gave him his sight so that he could see, and he was very happy about that. But even worse would be able, wouldn't it, to not be able to see that Jesus is our savior. And you and I are able to see that Jesus is our Savior because Jesus, the light of the world, has shined into our hearts 
And through that word, the Holy Spirit has created faith and trust in Jesus as our Savior. And that was even a greater miracle. And Jesus did that greater miracle for the man we're going to hear about in my sermon this morning. That he needed to see and know who his Savior was. He was looking for him, but he didn't know who he was. But Jesus opened his heart and his eyes to see that he, Jesus, was in fact his Savior. So the man received his physical sight, and the man received sight to see Jesus as his Savior. And that's true for you and me, too. Thankfully, when you and I were born, we were able to see, and we weren't blind, and we're, we're not blind now. But we didn't know Jesus was our Savior until we were baptized or came to know Jesus, and now we see him as our Savior. So we thank God, don't we, and we're happy, not only that we can see all the wonderful things that God's created, but that we can see Jesus as our Savior. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you through Jesus, the light of the world, to give us the knowledge of him as our Savior. We thank you for creating our eyes, that we are able to see all the wonderful blessings you give us, but most of all, to lighten our hearts to know that Jesus loves us and paid for our sins on the cross. In his name we pray, amen. Thank you, boys. We'll continue with our next hymn. <clears throat> Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. As Pastor Learman mentioned, the text of our sermon is our gospel lesson. 
dearly loved by God in Christ Jesus. St. John's Gospel is the gospel that contains Jesus' great I am statements. In chapter 8, we read these words of Jesus, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In this miracle before us this morning, Jesus gives a practical, personal application of those words that he spoke to the Pharisees on the Mount of Olives. The author of our opening hymn had experienced the truth of those words and wrote, I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. So did the man, born blind, see for the very first time. Jesus shined his light as the light of the world into the man's physical eyes and into his heart. And in both cases, darkness yielded to the light of the world. Well, see, first of all, that Jesus manifested the work of God in connection with this man. And secondly, that this was all part of Jesus coming into this world for judgment. We are blessed to live in a time when blindness is not nearly as common as it was even a decade ago. Doctors are, are able to delay blindness or prevent blindness. In some cases, they're even able to restore sight to someone who is blind. And there are even documented cases of a person miraculously being able to see when previously they couldn't. Certainly our hearts and prayers go out for people we know or others who still must suffer from that malady of, of blindness. Blindness was much more common in Jesus' day. On one journey, our Savior saw a man blind from birth. Sadly, the man was begging, which speaks to the somewhat sad situation in Israel that the people didn't help him like they were supposed to, but they just left this blind man out on the street in order to beg to have any kind of a living. But when they met him, Jesus' disciples asked the Lord a question that is still around today. Who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? Surely they believed, as some people do, that there is a, a link, a, a connection between a particular sin and a physical malady like blindness. But Jesus answered immediately, it was not that this man sinned or his parents. Certainly it's true that some sins bring consequences of the sin. Think of certain diseases that are caused by some sins or troubles or accidents or ways of living that come as a result of sin. But there really is no connection. God does not match a particular sin with a particular malady in our lives or in anybody else's life. But there was a reason for the man's blindness. Jesus told the disciples, no, that's not it. There's no fault here. 
There's no fault with this man's parents that he should somehow be suffering. But there is a purpose for it. And Jesus told them what that purpose is. That God's works might be revealed in connection with him. This was no chance meeting. Jesus and the man were supposed to meet. Because many, many years before, in fact, in one of the missing verses, the man's parents says, say that he is of age and he's old enough to, to speak for himself. So he was, was an adult. But many, many years before, this child had been born blind so that one day he would meet Jesus and Jesus would be able to do this miracle, to do the work of God in connection with him. God's providence proceeds on no human timetable. So this was meant to be years and years after the man was born blind so that Jesus could give him his sight and show that he is God. The light of the world in this particular miracle took some ground and spit in it and made mud to put on the man's eyes. Why he did that, I don't know. Jesus does what he does. But it's a, a visible element to put on the eyes, to maybe show blindness a little bit more. But the power was not in the mud. The power, of course, was in the word of God. So Jesus put that mud on the man's eyes, commanded him to go and to wash in the pool of Siloam in Jerusalem. What was the result? So he went and washed and came back seeing. Darkness yielded to the light of the world. The Son of Man used his divine power and the compassion that filled his human heart to give this man something that he had never had, to give him back his physical sight. Jesus says that he did this in the day before the night comes when no man can work. The day is really the time of Jesus' ministry on earth. It was the day of his, where he says, as long as I'm in this world, I am the light of the world. So in the, the day of his ministry, he was doing these wonderful, powerful works in connection with people in his power and because of his love. Before the night comes, when he wouldn't do that anymore. And the night was when his ministry would come to an end. And I couldn't help but think, when I looked at these words of Jesus, to be reminded of what John later said about Judas after he left the assembly of Jesus and the disciples on Monday, Thursday night. Remember? He said, and it was night. Jesus' earthly ministry was coming to an end and he would suffer this darkness, this, this night of suffering and dying as our substitute, taking our place as our Savior from sin. Jesus' power heals us from all diseases according to his will. Sometimes he still does that with a miracle. Other times he uses human instruments in his hands in order to give us those blessings of physical healing. But we always know 
that whatever malady we may be enduring, it is not a punishment for a sin. God never punishes us for our sins because he punished Jesus. And he is a righteous God who would not punish us when he has already punished our substitute and now he has given us forgiveness and redemption through that work of our Lord Jesus. You and I still must endure living in a sinful world, having a sinful nature, but we look forward, don't we, to the day when we will leave those behind and we will have our glorified bodies when we will no longer suffer pain or maladies in our physical beings. Darkness yields to the light of life. And that was the case with this man as he gained his physical sight. And as God does his works in connection with us, as God gives us relief from our sufferings. Jesus goes on to add though, for judgment I came into this world in order that those who do not see will see, and those who do see will become blind. Judgment in this context doesn't mean condemnation. It really means that this is the effect of Jesus being in the world. This is simply what happens. There's a judgment about who he is. Those who do not see him, who are blind to who he is, will gain that spiritual sight through the light of life. But there will be those, on the other hand, who think they see, who think they have great spiritual insight, they will be blind. They will continue in their spiritual blindness as they continue to deny Jesus as the Savior. So the man who gained his sight told his neighbors and told the people who had seen him begging along the side of the street what Jesus had done for him and who had done it for him. This Jesus was the one who had given him his sight. He had trusted Jesus' words, didn't he? When Jesus told him, go and wash in the pool of Siloam, he did it. Doesn't he remind us of Peter? When Peter told Jesus, you know, Lord, we fished all night, we haven't caught anything. This really isn't the time of day that you catch anything. But because you say so, I will let down my nets for a catch. Because Jesus said, let down your nets for a catch. So there wasn't just a command. There was a promise for obeying the command. And so this man experienced that, didn't he? He obeyed Jesus' command, trusting in Jesus, God's word, and as a result, he received the blessing that Jesus promised him. He washed in the pool of Siloam and received his sight. Well, this was just too much for the Pharisees. So they called the man in to investigate this miracle to find out just exactly what happened. Twice they called the man in and he explained to them what had happened. He explained to them who had performed the miracle and they who thought they could see were blinded. They hardened their hearts to the truth of that miracle. They said, you know, he healed on the Sabbath day. 
He's, he's got to be a sinner. That's just not done. That, that breaks our law to heal on the Sabbath day. They didn't, of course, understand, did they, the law of love. Here was a man who had never seen, and now he could see. He, he had his sight. And all they could do was condemn Jesus. In fact, they said, he has to be a sinner because he broke the Sabbath law of, he, of not healing on the Sabbath. Well, then the man told them again what they had done, what Jesus had done. And then they just outright denied the truth that literally was staring in their face. He hadn't been able to see, and now he could. And they just denied that he had ever been blind in the first place. That he was making all of this up because you are a disciple of this man. We are the disciples of Moses. And so those who could see became blind and even blinder. And finally, when they thought the man was lecturing him, them, something they couldn't abide, they threw him out of the temple. Well, Jesus went looking for him and, and found him and asked him, do you believe in the Son of Man? And here the man would have related Son of Man with the Messiah, with the Savior. And he said, well, yes, I do, but I don't exactly know who he is. Tell me who he is so that I can, can believe in him. And Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Do you remember the other time that Jesus said almost those exact words? Remember the Samaritan woman? And she said, you know, our fathers told us that Messiah is coming. And what did Jesus say? The one who is standing here talking to you is he, is the Messiah. And she believed. And so this man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. The man had been spiritually blind at one time, but the Holy Spirit had given him faith in the coming Messiah, and then the Holy Spirit worked faith in his heart that he saw in Jesus the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies, that he could see in his heart that Jesus is the Savior from sin. Those Pharisees who became even blinder to the truth of Jesus are parallel to the Pharisees when Jesus told them, the healthy do not need a physician. And he said, those who do see will become blind. Will you catch Jesus' irony in those statements? They didn't really see, they thought they did, but they were blind. They weren't really healthy and didn't need a physician. They were really spiritually sick and needed him as their savior. They really were spiritually blind and needed him as the light of the world. But those who think they see and continue to deny Jesus remain blind so long as they do not see. But by the miracle of the Holy Spirit working faith in our hearts, darkness has yielded to the light of the world in our hearts. You and I were born blind, spiritually blind. But the light of the world shined into our hearts through the gospel in word and in sacrament. Jesus has touched our eyes and he has touched our hearts. And so we say with 
the man born blind who now can see. Lord, I believe. And we bow down and worship him. Amen. And now the peace of God that surpasses all understanding shall guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand and we'll join in confessing our Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated and gather our offerings for the Lord. We bring our gifts, O Lord, to you for all your love, so great and true. You gave your Son that we might be forever from our sins set free. Lord, may these gifts your blessings bring, your grace and truth through them to sing, for all the world to know your love, and so to reach our home above. Amen. Please stand for prayer. In our prayers today, we also offer up our continued prayer for Pastor Shinnick as he considers the call that has been extended to him. And a prayer also for Myron Duan of our congregation 
who had become ill and is now in the hospital in Savannah, Georgia. Let us pray. Lord of love and life, you came into this sin-dark world to bring the glorious light and truth of your salvation for lost sinners. The multitude of miracles you performed testifies to the fact that you are indeed the one and only Son of God. By your teaching and preaching, you showed to all the love of God to lost sinners. You opened the eyes of the physically blind so that they might see. And far more importantly, you opened the eyes of those who are spiritually blinded by sin to see you as the true Savior for all people. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for shining the light and power of your good news upon our hearts, minds, and souls. You have called us out of spiritual darkness to the light of your salvation. Our souls, once lost in sin, have now been brought to you. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to bless and keep us in the power of your gospel message and word and sacraments, to remain in faith with you, and finally to receive the crown of life that you promised to all who believe and trust in you as their Savior. Our world remains lost in the depth and darkness of sin. Millions upon millions are on the path that will only lead to eternal death. You are the only hope, Lord Jesus, for this sin-dying world. May the light of your gospel continue to shine out into this world of lost sinners. Continue to bless the preaching and teaching of your word here in this house of worship, in the work of our pastors and missionaries, and wherever your word goes out. Make us eager and willing to support and encourage the work you have given us to do. Move the hearts of more and more of our young men and women to consider preparing for service in your church as pastors, teachers, or staff ministers. Fill our Christian homes and families with a love for you and for your word, that we may rejoice in our fellowship with you and our fellow believers. Gracious Lord, we pray for your continued guidance for Pastor Shinnick as he considers the call that has been extended to him to come here and serve as our pastor. Guide him, we pray, Lord, in the decision that will best serve the work and glory of your kingdom. We also come to you, O Lord, to seek your help, blessing, and strength for Myron Dewan, who has been hospitalized in Savannah, Georgia. Be with him, we pray, and grant him your strength to return home soon once again. Be with his wife, Bertie, and their family to give them the assurance that all things are in your gracious hands. In your name we ask this, O Lord, we pray. Amen. We continue with our liturgy and service and our celebration of the Lord's Supper with the sacrament on page 5. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good right that we should at all, at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God through Jesus Christ our Lord who willingly died under the curse of this world's sin, so that we may live forever in the light of God's blessings. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
praise and thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, and we remember the great acts of love through which he has ransomed us from sin, death, and the devil's power. By his incarnation, he became one of us. By his perfect life, he fulfilled your holy will. By his innocent death, he overcame hell. By his rising from the grave, he opened heaven. Invited by your grace and instructed by your word, we approach your table with repentant and joyful hearts. Strengthen us through Christ's body and blood and preserve us in the true faith until we face with him and all his ransomed people in everlasting glory. Amen. And in our Lord's name we join in his prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given into death for you. Do this often in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is the covenant, my new covenant in my blood, poured out for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
Please stand for prayer. We give you thanks, O Lord, for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet that you have given us to eat and to drink in this sacrament. Through this gift, you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your Spirit, help us to live as your holy people until that day when you will receive us as your guests at that wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Please be seated for our closing hymn. Once again, thank you for joining us for our worship today. Our, our thanks to Pastor Furch for sharing the message of our Lord's Word with us, to our organist and our ushers and all who have helped with the service today. We invite you to please spend a few moments with us and join us for our fellowship time uh, in the fireside room and for our Bible class as we consider and continue to consider the history about Pontius Pilate and Jesus in our past Savior's passion. A couple of other announcements for you today. 
One is regarding our upcoming Easter celebration and the Easter breakfast. Uh, we will celebrate Easter on April 9th with two services at 6.30 a.m. and 9 a.m. We want to provide a breakfast between services and we need your help. If, you have, if we have enough volunteers, we want to provide a hot breakfast of egg and baked casseroles, bakery, coffee, juice, and milk. We also need volunteers to set up on Saturday and help with cleanup afterwards. If you can help, please use the sign-up sheet in the fireside room. And if you do not have a recipe for egg bake, there is one available at the volunteer sign-up. So we hope you will be able to help us with that and for us to have a wonderful and joyful Easter celebration together in our fellowship. Also, a letter to share with you today addressed to you, dear members of Trinity St. Luke's. Over the last couple of weeks, God has given me the opportunity to consider my talents, gifts, and goals. I have enjoyed talking with current teachers, leaders, and members of your congregations as I deliberated where I can use my gifts best to serve God. After much prayer, I am returning the call to serve as your 3K teacher and early childhood director. I am excited for your ministry at Trinity St. Luke's and the great opportunity you have for outreach and growth in your early childhood program. My family will keep Trinity St. Luke's in our prayers as you continue to look to fill the position of the 3K teacher and early childhood director. The Lord will lead someone your way in his timing. I want to leave you with Jesus' words of sharing the gospel with others. Matthew 5, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify by your Father in heaven. God bless your ministry as you work together to connect families with their Savior in Christ, Amber Terry. And so we will be again arranging for a future call once again to extend, be extended here for this position in our congregation. A reminder to you of our upcoming, or the fifth of our midweek Lenten devotions will be held this coming Wednesday, both in our afternoon and evening service. Please come and join us for that and continue to grow in God's grace and wisdom. May the Lord be with you in the day ahead and bring you back to his house of worship again very soon.